from the Creator. It's from our Father God. And let's not ever um, forget that. Let's not ever take that for granted. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing Vince's is it a four-week series, Pastor Vince? A four-week series, and, and, and as we've come to expect, another provocative title uh, <laughs> to challenge our thinking. Uh, I believe the subtext is, it's not what you think, but the title is, which church would Jesus choose today? I'm going to hand it over to Vince, and he's going to explore this with us. Amen? Amen. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> I... Um, I always uh, want to create interest, Amen. and uh, that is really in the in the theme. Um, already, we're going to be talking about church. Obviously, if I just simply said, "What does the Bible teach about church?" That's pretty flat sort of subject, isn't it? <laughs> um, but we're going to be looking at pictures in in the Bible that uh, perhaps you have not considered. But firstly, let me just say how pleased I am to see you all out tonight. Uh, I think that's great. You know, when the, when the cold weather starts k- kicking in, uh, it's a lot easier to stay home and watch it on live streaming. <laughs> uh, welcoming also all the people on live streaming that are following. <laughs> but, uh, but these ones are the ones that really are super committed. Yeah, I mean, you, you guys are going to get, you're go, you guys are going to get really in the, in the kingdom of God, your place at the table is going to be right up there. <laughs> anyway, but you're at the table as well, so there you go. All right. But um, I, have, I have taught extensively on the church and what the Bible says about the church, and, and we go into detail um, on the pictures that are, are, are well known, uh, pictures like um, uh, the, the temple, which speaks of the presence of God, the household of faith, which is more the family of God, then you've got the bride, which is uh, uh, the one that is waiting uh, the return of her groom to come and, and uh, prepare for the, uh, the wedding in, in heaven. Uh, and uh, uh, there's also the body, the body of Christ, the functioning body. So all of these pictures are well-known pictures uh, relating to the church. Um, but I would like to bring four different pictures that people don't usually associate with the church, and yet they're very important pictures that we find. Um, uh, what, which church would Jesus join today? Now, I know everybody would like to say ours, you see. <laughs> so where would we ask him to sit? You know? <laughs> um, well, of course, that's ridiculous to talk like that. Um, but, but there is a point in this. There is a point in this that there are many different kinds of churches. So what's important in a church, ultimately? There's a lot of things we can do, and, and, and I guess we can do them and, or not do them. Um, but what are the, the things that will ultimately um, reflect the very purpose of the church? And there has to be purpose to it. There has to be purpose to, to the church. And so we've, we've got a picture uh, in the parable of the wedding feast and the guests. And how, how often you've read this parable, and I've uh, dealt with it in in our um, series on the parables, 100 Parables of Jesus in Chermside and the Chermside Outreach. Um, But I haven't brought out this aspect of this parable. So we're going to read it out of the New King James Version, uh, Matthew 22, verses 1 to 10. So let's get it up on the screen. Thanks, Luke. It's coming up, no doubt. Matthew 22, verses 1 to 10. Here we go. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. So straight away, what does that make you think of? Exactly. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Uh, Verse 3, And sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Verse 4, again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My ox and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Um, Oh, okay. Well, look, I'll read it from, uh, you can catch up with me and I'll read it from uh, from my Bible. 
All right, so we're up to verse 4. Matthew 22. Verse 5. Verse 5, thank you. All right. I'll find it in a second. All right, verse 5. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those those murderers and burnt up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. All right, one of the keys to understanding Um, the parable and the real sense of a parable is to correctly identify the symbols that are used. If you you miss that, then you won't get the the sense. You can make all sorts of things out of a parable, but to get the the correct meaning, you need to correctly understand the symbols that are used. And so uh, we've got a panorama here of God's eternal purpose in in this short story. The king is quite simply God. The son is, well, in, uh, uh, un, uh, un, uh, it, it, can't be, it can't be discussed, it can't be uh, argued. It's, it is Jesus, obviously. The wedding feast is a reflection of the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. The, the wedding of the son is in heaven. Um, and so it speaks of heaven and eternal life, the wedding feast. The guests are all men and women and children who are invited, and who respond to the invitation. That's very important. And so there are two actual uh, uh, groups of people who, who, are, who receive the invitation. The first one is that was established by the king. It was his guest list. Uh, and the second is people that the king didn't know. It was extended far beyond a list that the king had prepared initially. The servants are committed disciples of Jesus. And I'd like to suggest that we have the church in this story with the committed disciples of Jesus. Jesus didn't have anything else but committed disciples. Do you understand that? He didn't have sympathizers. He didn't have uh, uh, cultural Christians. Uh, He had committed disciples. And uh, then he had, then there is the invitation. And the invitation is the message of the gospel. Um, do, do, do you understand that the gospel is not a theology? It's not a doctrine. And it's not the same thing as an explanation of the plan of redemption. The gospel is essentially an invitation to an individual. And that invitation can be accepted or refused. And it is summed up in one word. And that word is come. Come. Jesus related to people around that word, come. You know these verses. Come to me, all you who weary and are heavy laden or burdened. To the rich young ruler, sell what you own and come, follow me. To the disciples, let the little children come to me. To the two disciples of John the Baptist, come and see. And to the crowds again, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me. And drink. So Jesus was always issuing this invitation. And as we bring the gospel to people who, who don't know Christ and who don't have faith, a, a saving faith in Christ, then our invitation is one of come, come to Jesus. Um, so uh, we find that people uh, then who receive that invitation and who respond to that invitation then they are the ones that carry the invitation to others. So we have the example of Philip. Uh, He's come to Jesus, and now he says to his friend Nathaniel, come and see. See, so there's the word again. Uh, The Samaritan woman, uh, Jesus has revealed himself. One of the few times he's actually revealed himself as the saviour of the world was to the Samaritan woman. And then the Samaritan woman goes back into her village, 
And she speaks to all the men of the village and she says, come and see a man who told me everything I've done. So here we have uh, the invitation of the gospel that is taken to uh, different levels of guests. The church here in this story, represented by the, the committed disciples, the servants who actually respond, become God's instrument, become God's envoy bearing the invitation. In this whole plan of bringing guests into, into heaven to fill the banquet hall for his son's wedding depends on the work of these, uh, these servants and these uh, committed disciples. Such is their importance. You see, the, the success of the feast ultimately depended on the success of the servants. They understood their mission and they gave themselves fully to it. And uh, I would like to suggest tonight that nothing has changed 2,000 years later, that the success of God's wedding feast will ultimately depend on the work of the determined and, uh, and committed servants. Now, let me say something about church. I've been a pastor of, of a church uh, since 1977. So that's going back a bit. And I have found that and as, a, as a general rule, that you've got about, you've got three categories in churches. You've got the first category, the first category which I would call the core group of passionate people. They're usually about 10% of a congregation. And they are prepared to work hard to invite people, even if they receive no encouragement. It's come from their relationship with God. It comes from their own personal motivation. And they will just do it because they've understood something. Then there's another core group. Uh, that would be also around 10%, who will never invite anybody. Even if Jesus was to personally visit them in the night and ask them to do it, they'd say, yes, Lord, and in the end, they'd find some reason not to do it. But between those two extremes, I'd say, you've got the middle ground. 80% of church members who would love to see people get saved who would love to see God touch people's lives and, and to see people added uh, to God's kingdom. But they're timid in witnessing. They, they don't know how to start. They, they kind of feel, well, I've tried and it didn't really work. I'm not made for this. Um, and so they basically uh, have a Christian experience uh, that accepts that other people are not Christians and that they are. Uh, that's the middle ground. Well, any politician knows that if he wants to win an election, it's not going to be with the extremes because the extremes will not change. They will not budge. The ultimate result of an, elect of an election will be his ability to win over the middle ground. And I believe that's also a challenge in church life that, that here we have so many people who love God and yet who are timid in terms of taking this, this invitation out to people who may reject it. That's a reality, isn't it? It's a reality in this story. And so, so what, what I'm uh, looking at is, is, is firstly I'd speak to leaders and say it's up to the leaders and it's the role of leaders to stir motivation, to bring encouragement and to provide good opportunities that incite people to invite. It's all very important. It comes down to how we, as the Christians, view church, a church. How do we view a church? How do we see a church? So parables are what Jesus used to teach. In fact, there's even a passage that says that he only taught in parables. Um, so what is a parable? A parable is a natural picture that is taken from everyday life that everybody understands that actually hides or reveals a spiritual truth. That's what a, it's a very simple definition. It is a natural picture that will reveal spiritual truth or 
hide spiritual truth. Jesus used both. So my, my question is tonight, in our everyday uh, life and activities, what's the best natural picture that we can find that reflects how we view church and how it should be? That's my, that's my challenge. So I've got a number of suggestions to you tonight. So there's, there's a number of possibilities. What's the best natural picture of our day to express how Jesus views the church? Okay, first possibility, church is a cinema. People come as spectators because they're interested in a certain film. They arrive, they pay their money, they sit down, they look at the film and they leave making comments whether they liked it or they didn't like it at all. They're not at all going to be coming back next week unless you happen to have another film that, you, uh, that they would want to see. But otherwise, there's absolutely no reason for them to come back, you see. When uh, we started our first church in Paris uh, on a Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, uh, I would get this phone call from the same man who would ask me what I was going to preach on to see if he was going to come or not. So uh, is, is, that, is that what church is about? Uh, that's pretty easy to answer, isn't it? That's not it. It's, it's not. It, you're not here as spectators, I hope. You know, um, I mean, we're in a kind of a spectator situation. But, but man, we're, we're not here to, to create spectators. Uh, so that's not it. That's not it. Okay, second possibility. Church is like a chess club. People who like playing chess meet each other each week, meet, meet one another each week and, and, uh, and, and play chess with other people who enjoy also playing chess. They become chess club friends and they enjoy meeting together to play chess, say, on Sunday mornings. When the game ends, they go home and they say, see you next week when we will once again play chess together. Do you think Jesus would join a church like that? No. I don't think so. No. A club? No. And yet a lot of churches are clubs. A lot of churches don't even have one baptism the whole year of a new convert. Very rarely does someone who's not, not a converted Christian ever enter, enter through the gates or the doors. Third possibility. This one, my, my wife inspired me with this. A hair and beauty salon. <laughs> Ladies go there to feel good about themselves. They look at themselves in the mirror and they don't necessarily like what they see. They hate the way their hair is. I must get it cut. I hear that at home. <laughs> Guys, do you ever hear that from your wife? I hear that. My wife, about three or four days out from going to her appointment with, the, at the, at the, um, with, with her hairdresser, she just cannot stand her hair. I say, it looks all right, Denise. Oh, no, no, she's not happy. So if it's a hair and beauty salon, it's kind of like ladies who are not happy with the way they look. And then while they're at it, they're going to look at their wrinkles and say, well, I need a facial, a mud facial. That's what I need. And then they, they kind of look at their nails and say, well, I really need to get my nails done as well. And while I'm there, I'll get a massage. And then after I've done all that, I'll feel much better. Is, is, is that church? Do, do we come so that we can feel better? And yet we do feel better, don't we? But, but we, we had someone in our family who, was, who really mocked us as Christians, you know, and we came back from church one Sunday when we were staying with them and, and, and the lady said, said to us, so you feel better now? <laughs> you see, um, hey, we do feel better, but we don't come for that, do we? And yet... If you go to a Christian bookshop, you will see row after row after row of books about feeling better for you, about yourself. Yeah. You see, there's, there's so much of this in our, in our uh, um, Christian circles that you wonder if being a Christian is so that you can live a better temporal life. I wonder what the early Christians thought about that. I, w I wonder what they thought when they had the goods confiscated and thrown in jail and... And, and, and hung or, or, or crucified. You know, oh, we're here so we can feel good about our lives, you know. 
Well, listen, you, you came to Christ, you lost everything. How, how do you feel now? You see? But they were focused on eternal life. Doesn't matter what they had to go through because that was where the, 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 the wedding was. That was where the banquet hall was. See, so hair and beauty salon doesn't fit for a church. Oh, here's another one. A council bus. The pastor is the driver. He has the license. The Christians are the passengers. They all have their day's activities and they get on the bus and they get off the bus along the road as long as it suits them. For a while, they're all going in the same direction, just for a while. The pastor does all the work, but the passengers tell him what he should do. Stop the bus. I want to get off. When he finally gets to the depot at the end of the day, the bus is empty and he's on his own. I shared this once with some pastors and they were all depressed after I shared it. <laughs> they said, that's about right too, sometimes. that's the way we feel. Yeah. All right, now this one's going to bother you. I've got, uh, I've got two more before I'll give you mine. A family. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? A family sounds really good. But think about it. A church must have a family spirit. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. There's no doubt about that. But a church must never be a family. Families are too hard to break into. If you want to join a family, you've got to marry one of the girls. And even then, you're not a son, you're an in-law. You see, it's a closed circle. Uh, and, and churches that are closed circles, uh, they only, the new people, they're only visitors. They're only visitors. We'll, we'll, we'll accept you and we'll welcome you as visitors. But it'll take you 10 years before you really join us, before we feel comfortable with you, before you're like us. You see, so you, you can't have that. It can't be a, a family that, that, that someone's got to break into and then it's, the relationships are very difficult. A, a church should be such a welcoming church. And I believe New, New Hope is a welcoming church. And we integrate people so easily. We have to integrate people so easily. So let me suggest that while we have to have a family spirit, we must never be a close-knit family that people can't come and join us. Now, this one will bother you, seriously. A hospital. This is the picture that best describes most Pentecostal churches. A hospital. Need-orientated. The pastor is the surgeon. The leaders are the nurses. Everything there is geared for sick people. Hospital churches major on the problems of the Christians. You hear it in the prayers, in the preaching, in the words of the songs, in the conversations, in the prophecies, needs. If you're a well person, the hospital's the last place you want to go. You'll catch somebody else's infection. You see, people do get healed in church. And we are sensitive to people's needs. And we do have compassion. And we do set up things that will allow them to, to be ministered to. But that's not the reason we are church. Do you understand? Yeah. And yet we've made what is a secondary thing, sorry, but we've made it the most important thing when Jesus has not made it the most important thing. And so don't get me wrong. Churches are places where people get healed and need to get healed. But it mustn't be a hospital because we can only minister to people who are down and out, who are unhappy, you know, people who, who've lost everything, who are depressed. You know, and if someone comes along and you say, well, come to Jesus and you'll be happy, he said, I'm already happy. Oh, well, that's not possible. You don't have Jesus. Well, look, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll come back tomorrow when you're unhappy. How's that? Even better, tonight I'll go home and I'll pray that you'll become unhappy so that I can then give you a message that requires you to be happy. You, you know, it's, the gospel is not based on, on, on our needs. The gospel is based on the forgiveness 
of our spiritual condition. The gospel is based there. And we've got to come back to the understanding, essential understanding, that is spiritual. And then, as a secondary thing, the temporal life is improved. Of course it is. The love, joy, peace, all of that has, has a major, major effect upon our lives. But we are not a hospital. We can, we can welcome and minister to people who are happy, people whose kids are not on drugs, whose wife hasn't left them, people who've got a good job and are not struggling with the cost of living. We can minister to them because their ultimate need, like everybody's need, is a spiritual one, not just a social one or, or a, a humanitarian one. Okay, let me give you my best picture, and I've got to justify it from Scripture. For, my, for me, the best natural picture for a church is the change room of a football team. The change room of a football team. So what happens in the change room of a football team? Well, firstly, when the members of the team arrive, they take off their clothes and they put on a jersey. You see? Suddenly, there's, there's an identifying with the collective. They're no longer me and the way I like dressing. And No, no, now we, we belong to a, a, a team now. We've got the same jersey. They understand in the, in the change room of a football team, they begin to understand the things like coach. What's the role of a coach? The captains. They have a captain in the team. Their own position on the team. They learn about the opponents, strategies, so that they, the team can win, so that they get the motivation. The motivation happens in the change room of a football team. And that motivation changes last week's defeat in the next week's victory. You see? And motivation will change the Broncos' victory of last week into a bigger victory this week. Yes. Come on. You see? Sorry for all the Sydney siders. But the game itself is not played in the change room of a football team. The game itself is played out on the field. But what happens in the change room will decide what happens on the field. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why, for me, the picture is perfect because, because what happens here will decide what happens out there. That's, that's, the, that's the motivation, the understanding of, of our opponents, the strategy set in, set in place, the identity, understanding our role, all of that happens here so that when we're out on the, the pitch, then we win the match. When someone is injured during the match, what do they do? They come out with a stretcher, put him on the stretcher, bring him back to the change room, put a bandage around his head, and the guy goes, thanks. And then off he goes again. Why? Because his team's out there and he wants to be part of the victory. You see? He's not there, oh, great, <laughs> I can have a bit of a rest now. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I've done pretty good, really. No, 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 he, he wants to be out there. And they come out with bandages all over the place. But they're motivated because their team's playing. Jesus is the coach looking for a team. He's the coach. He's looking for a team. And a church is his team change room. Do you understand the picture? That's a parable. That's a Vince parable, that one. Yeah. You're allowed to make your own parables, you know, as long as they reflect Scripture. So Jesus trains his team. He motivates them, instructs them. Uh, how he wants to play, and then on match day, he sends them out on the field, and he is with them, but on the sidelines. Now, I've got an example of that to show you. It's found in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 11. Just keep that picture in mind. Jesus in the change room, preparing his team to be out on the field. Here we go. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. That's one heck of a team. And sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Do you understand that, that he was asking them to pray about themselves? Because they were going out into the harvest. But something had to happen to them because they were just disciples, but then they had to become 
they had to become laborers of the harvest. You see, and so as so, and this is just a by the way, and I'm adding this, but Jesus is not asking him to pray about somebody else. He's sending them out, asking them to pray that they themselves would become laborers of the harvest as they go. Anyway, that's something else that I can develop some other time. Let's keep going. Go on your way. Behold, I send you out. This is the coach speaking. Go on your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither bag, money bag, knapsack or sandals and greet no one along the way. But whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same houses. All these instructions he's giving them. Eating and drinking such things as they give. For the labor is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as, as I set before you. He's saying, you guys are going to eat well, I tell you. We send you out, you're going to eat well. Verse 9, and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, you go out into its streets and say the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. And then verse 11, just to finish off the passage, uh, if it's coming, no. All right. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it's there. It's already up there. So, so th can you imagine having the 70 there and Jesus, the coach, giving them all these instructions and then he's sending them off uh, and it's, it's, they're sending out onto the field and that's where the match is being played. Now, I, I want to say that I take this very seriously um, because you know, we, we are launching Chermside Outreach and we have, it's coming up for 12 months now that we've started the outreach, which is, I don't know where that, that year has gone. And for those of you who are part of Chermside Outreach, you'll, uh, you'll be surprised to know that we've been going for, for 12 months. And uh, um, l let me just say how pleased I am to see, uh, to see Cole there. It is Cole, isn't it, in the, in, in the shadows? Yeah. Cole gave his life to the Lord back in October at Chermside Outreach. He loves the Lord. And it's great to see him along. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah um, we, we, we have operated, Denise and I, in churches that we've planted. And one of the first things we put into place was what we call a visitor's service. And because I was driving the thing, then we would have it once a month, which meant that once a month, the Sunday service was devoted to having a service for visitors. And we geared everything up for visitors. The kind of songs we would sing, uh, what form the worship would take, and it wouldn't be worship. Um, the message that was coming through the songs, we didn't sing about the Lion of Judah and the Lamb that was slain, uh, the images that people just can't understand when they haven't got Bible culture. Um, we would not have a testimony. We would have an interview. People uh, are used to interviews. People are getting interviewed on TV all the time, so we would have an interview. Um, we, we just And, and a message uh, that uh, we, we, we would broadcast the theme a special theme that we knew would grab people who didn't know the Lord, who, that, that would grab their interest. Uh, and, uh, and then, come the Sunday, uh, it took us about, when we started this one in Paris, it took us about a year to start to get a steady flow of visitors to come in. But on the final Sunday, when we left Paris to come back to Australia, and we had a visitor Sunday, we had 40 non-Christian people in our services because of the fact that we had done this month after month after month. And, and we operated on the basis, we are doing the most important thing at the most important time. The most important time in any church is a Sunday meeting. And so we're telling, we're making a big statement here. We're saying we're doing the most important thing at the most important time. That's when we're going to have a visitor service. Not a Friday night, not a Saturday night. Sunday morning, that was our service. And so we've started visitor services at Chermside Outreach. And we've got our next one coming up in three days' time. Yes. yes. And so we've been preparing for that. And so this is how it happens. See, this is, this is the strategizing. Um, we're not doing this uh, in a haphazard way. We're, not, we're doing it intentionally, deliberately. 
Um, Denise has produced a beautiful brochure. Uh, I've come up with the theme, Life After Life, How Can We Be Sure? Now, that'll interest people. I didn't purposely put life after death because when people see death, they get scared. Words are, are, are loaded, so you have to choose them. Uh, choose them well. We set a theme. Tomorrow, James and his team will be distributing in letterboxes around, around Chermside and around the, the, the building where we have it, 400 of these brochures. They're going into the letterboxes. Last Sunday, we distributed three brochures to everybody that was present in the service at, at Chermside so that everybody had three brochures that they could then hand on to somebody that they met or somebody that they had on their hearts or somebody that, that, uh, that they knew. Uh, so uh, we sent uh, a brochure to everybody who receives the notes of the, the parables. About 80 people receive every week the notes of the parable. They all got a, a, an invitation. We, uh, we sent an invitation to uh, an, a digital copy to everybody who attends or who has attended Chermside Outreach, asking them to send it on to their, uh, to their email contacts or to their Facebook friends. Um, last Sunday was a preparation Sunday, and I preached a motivational message. I always do just before Visitor Sunday. And I preached on the parable of Je that Jesus said, I am the way. The one, anyone who comes, or no one who comes to, no one comes to the Father but by me. Sorry, no one comes to the Father but by me. And we talked about Jesus saying, "I am the road." And match day is Sunday at 10 a.m. Yes. Uh, and that's what we'll see. What God has given us. Now, you know, I belong to the uh, Glenn McGrath School of Ministry. Have you heard of Glenn McGrath? Yeah, I, I belong to the Glenn McGrath School of Ministry. So Glenn McGrath was one of the, for those who don't know, was one of the most successful fast bowlers that Australia's ever produced. Um, and, and the secret of his success was putting the ball in the right spot every time. Putting the ball in the right spot every time. And let the ball do the work. Let the conditions do the work. And this is one of the secrets of how the Lord has been able to use us and I, I say that by the grace of God, that we have just really concentrated on doing the right thing long enough for it to really work. And, and that's the key of all this, the key of it, the key of it all. And so, and, and so um, we're putting this into practice. And I, this is not just some a pre preaching, an ideal. This is something that's very practical if you want to make it practical. And, in the, and, and at the end of the story... We hear this, that the servants say this, and the wedding, and the wedding hall was filled with guests, or the, the narrative says, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. That was very important for them. That was very important. And, and in fact, in the other parable of uh, where there's a feast, and that's in Luke chapter 14, we're not going to look at it, um, but it's even stronger, the importance of filling the hall. Uh, it says this, Master, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master replied, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come, that my house may be filled. Do you know that an empty wedding hall is a shame to the one who's invited, to the one who's issued the invitations? But a full wedding hall is to his honour. And the amazing thing about this story, because this parable is what I consider one of the extreme parables of Jesus. There's a number of them. Where he takes a picture and just blows it out of all proportion. It's like when he says, um, you know, that you've got a beam in your own eye. I mean, that is an extreme picture, isn't it? To have a beam in your own eye. There's a number of extreme pictures. This is an, an extreme picture. Can you imagine... A king inviting a, a wedding list, wedding guest list. Who does he invite? He invites his family and he invites his close friends. And nobody comes. Everybody refuses. Nobody from his family comes. No one of, none of his close friends come. That's not possible, is it? And that's one of the extreme parables. Because it would be to his dishonor. But what it tells us is that the first category of people that were invited refused. 
And so the invitation was extended far beyond the first category to those that were not initially called. Does that ring a bell? The Jews rejected Jesus. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. And then it was go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples. See, see we have a beautiful picture in that, in that parable of the whole panorama of God's purpose. So... Um, uh, filling a hall uh, it, it's got to be something that motivates us you know, I, I have a difficult relationship with an empty chair I've got to admit that you know I see an empty chair there and, and it speaks to me Look, it, it even looks like it's got its mouth open you know empty chair uh, they have pst- Are you the pastor here? Well, yeah. Uh, so why did you buy me? Well, I, I bought you to put a person on you. Well, where's the person? Who's the person? Well, I, I, I don't know. Uh, and then she complains. She says, well, when I'm not stack, stacked up the back of the hall, all I, all I ever get is a coat and a, a Bible. I don't get a person. I'm not talking about putting bums on seats, folks. I'm talking about people sitting at the table of God's wedding feast. That's what I'm talking about. Because the next person that can sit on that empty chair could be the next great salvation story. That's the one. Never did we think that Cole would sit down on one of those chairs that first time he came. And he sat down on an empty chair and he became the next great salvation story. You see? See, somehow that, that's got to inside us. That's got to, it motivates me. You know, I have, I have a difficulty with, with these empty chairs because our first hall in Paris, when we started in the centre of Paris, our church, we found a hall that had 200 seats and they were all plastic chairs. They were all orange. And our group only filled one row. And all of these empty chairs. And I would go home on a Sunday night and then I would dream orange. Oh, I don't like orange. I don't like orange. And, and one day the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. He says, do you like orange? I said, no. He said, well... If you don't like orange, find people, put them on the seats, you won't see orange. Oh, I thought, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, let me finish with a story. It was the eve of a, um, a visitor's Sunday in Paris. And we had our teams out on the streets. Said, Paris is a big city, 12 million people. Depends how you count them. Um, and so we had teams, about 20 people, and we had 5,000 brochures to distribute hand-to-hand in the street. We didn't put them in letterboxes, didn't put them anywhere else, just hand-to-hand with a kind word. And you can do that in Paris, more difficult in smaller towns. Um, we, the pile that we'd had shh, went right down. It was Saturday afternoon. Our teams had finished their work. And back at the office, still had a... A batch of, a pile of, a small pile, but still a pile of, of brochures, the flyers that hadn't been distributed. And, and I tell you, folks, I, I can't just take a bunch of flyers and throw them in a bin. Because you never know what can happen. You, know, you never know what can happen because, because we had one guy turn up. And I said, so how did you come to the meeting? And he said, well, I was in the street and a man in front of me, he had this bit of paper in his hand and he scrunched it up and threw it on the ground. And when I saw it, I thought, he said to me, I thought, I wonder what that is. So he picked it up. It was one of our flyers. He came to church, gave his life to the Lord. You you just don't know what God could do. You just don't know what God could do. So it was Saturday afternoon. I got this batch left over. Teams had finished. And suddenly one of the young guys turns up and he says, you got any more flyers to distribute? Oh, I said, you saw, I've, as a matter of fact, I do. I've still got a little pile. Oh, well, I've still got an hour, he said, and so I can go and do that. 
I said, good on you. Good on you. I said, look, just can you go where we, where we have our meeting, just the hall. It's a couple of, couple of metro stops further down. Uh, go out there because that's where the local people uh, will, be, will be getting around on a Saturday afternoon. Just hand them out there. He didn't listen to me. He just went up the road from the office and handed them out there. And then he came back a few minutes later, about 15, 20 minutes later, and he said, well, all done, all done. I said, boy, that was quick. He said, yeah, I just went up the road and handed them out. I said, OK, well, better that than throw them in the bin. Next morning, there was, a, there was a young man that was there with his bit of paper and he'd got it on the Saturday afternoon near the office. His name was Nurdin. He was an Algerian Muslim, a practicing Muslim. And he came to the meeting and he sat up the back and he listened attentively. And at the end of my message, when I made an altar call, he put his hand up. He came forward with others. And when I came to him, I, I got him to say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, the Saviour of the world. And he said, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, the Saviour of the world. Did you hear what you said, Nudin? Yes. Say it again. Jesus, I believe that you are the, you, you are the Son of God, Saviour of the world. I said, asked him to say it a third time. He said, do you really believe that? Yes, I do, he said. Good. That day totally changed that young man's life. That night he went home. Home was staying with some people who were practising Muslims. He, it wasn't his own family. He was just staying with them. And, and in his joy, he told them what he had done. So they kindly got his stuff and threw it out on the road. He suddenly found himself hopeless, homeless. But the Lord looked after him, he told me. He said, look, Lord looked after me. Now I've got a flat. Only, only three days later I got a flat. My own, my own apartment. I said, uh, legally? I said, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, good. God loves you. Looks after you. On Fridays, Fridays is a Muslim day of prayer. And there's a great central mosque in, in, in Paris. So you can imagine the, the, the busyness around that mosque. He would go on Fridays and he would go in the square in the centre of the mosque and he would preach Jesus to the young men that came for their prayers, for their Muslim prayers. He would preach Jesus. The day I baptised him, there were quite a lot of people, people from the outside as well that came. And I was about to baptise him. And he turned to me and he said, could I say something? And I said, sure, Nordia. And he looked at the people and he began to preach Christ. He began to preach Jesus, what Jesus had done for all of us. He, he was your evangelist. It was amazing. Some weeks later, he came to see me and he said, um, uh, Pastor Vince, um, I really have a burden for my people the Algerians, Muslims, living in the south of France in the city of Marseille. I, I really feel God wants me to go to Marseille to find a Christian organisation that works with them and I want to serve them with the gospel. I said, Nurdin, go and the Lord will go with you. It's an amazing story and all made possible because one Saturday afternoon, a young guy came and said, hey, any more brochures to hand out, any more leaflets? I've still got an hour. And because he did that, him and anybody else who gets saved through his testimony owes it to the young man that came and took a few leaflets and handed them out. And so... This story is a story about the church. The church is not the wedding feast. That's the kingdom. The end game is the kingdom. The church is what happens here on the earth. The church is committed servants taking the message, the come, the invitation now to everyone now who's invited.
This is not some restricted guest list. It's everyone is invited. And those who will accept the invitation will be admitted into the wedding feast. And that wedding feast, that wedding banquet, will be filled with guests. Let's pray, shall we? We just want to take a moment, Lord, to let all this sink in. Lord, we want to be those servants. Master said, go. The king said, go. They went. They had to put up with the rejection of the first wave. And those same ones went out again. Despite what happened the first time. Because the master... The king asked them to do it. They were sent. Lord, I sense a purpose. There's purpose here, Lord. There's purpose. We're not, we're not a chess club, Lord. We're not here as a hospital. We're not even a happy family all holding hands, looking into each other's eyes. There's purpose, Lord, in our being together. Jesus gave us the same jersey. He's giving us instructions. Sending us out onto the field. We thank you, Jesus. We give you praise, Lord. As I look across the auditorium today, most people I think I know, but there may be somebody here and, and you don't know Jesus. And you would like to know Jesus. You would like to respond to that invitation, come. Then I'd like you just briefly, just quickly, put up your hand. And when I see it, I'll say, okay, let's pray for you. Let's pray just a quick invitation but I think everyone here would know the Lord let's just make and examine ourselves and say am I one of those servants that the king can send out is that great fest uh, f festivity in the sky is that something I'm concerned about am I concerned about about God's banquet hall am I concerned about God's feast and his honour can God use me for someone else to be saved Father, we, we do think that this is so important for you. We do think that this is so important. Lord, we get a hold of it tonight. We take it on board. We make it our own. Wherever I go, there are so many Christians who have never led anyone to Jesus. So many. So many. Even leaders, quite often pastors, have never actually led someone personally to Jesus. Lord, today we want that to be turned around. We ask your help, Lord. We want that to be turned around so that we can rejoice 
with the angels when one lost sinner comes to repentance. We thank you, Jesus, for your help and your courage, your strength, and your compassion. Give you praise. He's the Savior of my soul. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. He's a savior of my soul. He's a savior of my soul. Jesus, 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 Jesus. He's a savior of my soul. He's a savior of my soul. Amen.